these last couple days are like my favorite kind of days ever where it's chilly in the morning and then nice and warm in the afternoon is anybody else with me on that is that oh i love them then there's also those people i know that they probably know that christmas is already in 65 days they've already got that down like some people know that well, we get a taste of uh, Christmas tonight in Isaiah with a couple really familiar texts to us. So, um, but let's recap a little bit. I'd encourage if you were not here last week, um, please listen to uh, the study. It was really rich. It was one of my favorite midweek studies we've ever had as a church. I was so blessed and encouraged and moved uh, myself in, in teaching Isaiah chapter 6, and let's just look at it real quick to to recap. Uh, The Lord begins by telling us that uh, Isaiah, in the year that King Uzziah died, and and again, Uzziah was a king for 52 years, a really great king for almost the entirety of that. The country was incredibly prosperous but in the year that he died he saw the lord high and lifted up and that was when he saw the lord in a way he never had before when when this great man a relative of his uzziah had gone off the scene that's when he saw the lord high and lifted up and his reaction to to really having that revelation of who god is undid him and he said woe is me for i am undone i'm a man of unclean lips and then uh, he had this interaction with the seraphim, and, and, and then he overhears the, the Trinity carrying on a conversation where they say, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? This is, that's in verse 8, the voice of the Lord. Who, whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And he said, here, here I am, send me. And he's like, I don't have much to offer you. Uh, but I have availability. And let me just say, I've probably heard me say this before, but I will say it over and over and over again. The greatest ability that you can have in ministry is availability. The Lord isn't looking for ultra-talented people. He's looking for available people, for willing people. People that, like Isaiah, understand their shortcomings, but say, here I am, send me it. I'll, I'll I'll go. I don't have much to offer you, but I, I offer you my willingness. And then he says, Lord, how long will I have this ministry? And the Lord tells him until everything's desolate, until there's no one else to preach to. I want you I want you to just keep going and keep going. And so he's he's commissioned with this call from the Lord. But the people, it, it says here, weren't permitted to understand. They had ears that would not hear, eyes that would not see. And, and, and he says, go until there, there's just no one else. There's not another ear with the potential of hearing anymore to listen to. And so now as we shift to chapter 7, we are g- introduced just headlong right into current events that are taking place in Isaiah's day. And, and weaved w- with that, these current events that we'll talk about as we go through, there's references to coming judgment and coming deliverance. And so all of that is kind of meshed together. Here's what's going on. There's, there's judgment coming. There's a warning coming. There's also deliverance coming. And we're going to see that, especially tonight, there's so many of these promises of deliverance that point squarely and directly to Jesus. And tonight is absolutely no exception. And so the first event, current event tonight, is the coming Assyrian invasion and its threat to the southern kingdom of Judah. And uh, we've talked about this before. If you've not been with us and you're not up to date on up to date on history, uh, I don't know if that makes sense or not. But Assyria was the world power at the time. They were large and in charge. And it says in uh, chapter seven, verse one. Now it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the grandson of Uzziah, king of Judah, that reason king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Ramalia, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to make war against it. 
but could not prevail against it. So this is what's going on. This is kind of a broad view of what's going on, current events right now. Obviously, the people, the nation, everybody is concerned about this issue. They're their, their sister nation, Israel, is joined a confederacy with, with Syria, and, and they're coming to attack. And everybody then would be looking to the government, would be looking to leadership, looking to Ahaz. He's got to have to be the one that, that takes us out of this, that delivers us from this. But Ahaz, if you were with us in our studies through Kings and Chronicles, he, Ahaz is as wicked as can be. He was about as wicked as any king in Judah uh, was. And the, like, the only thing good... You know, commentators will say that Ahaz did was he fathered Hezekiah. Like that's the only redeeming quality that he had. And so, like I said, we're we're jumping in the middle of this kind of complex situation, and Israel and Syria had joined forces. This is get confusing. I'll try to pretend like I'm looking at a map. Here's the Mediterranean. Israel and Syria had joined forces because Assyria. Is, is gaining in power and, and they are doing anything they can do to protect themselves from Assyria. And uh, like, well, man, if we join together, maybe that will help a little bit. And if you remember from our first session, uh, I use the illustration, it's like there's these freshmen that are getting bullied by a senior and these couple freshmen like if we tag team that'll help us a little bit you know from this big mean bully senior and if we can get a third guy that'll help even more well judah is the third guy and I'm like judah will you help us to defend ourselves against assyria and ahaz says no i, I don't want any any part of that They're like come on you know just if we join together you know we'll we'll be stronger together and he says nope and so the two freshmen syria and israel say well we'll just take him over anyway and will absorb all his resources and men and uh, that's already what's been going on right now is Syria and Israel have been engaging in battle against Judah the southern kingdom and Judah to this point has held them off once it says at the end there of the verse that they they did not prevail but it did cost Judah dearly I mean I'm just trying to set the stage here as we get into chapter 7 of how bleak the situation is for Judah. It says in 2 Chronicles 28 that they lost 120,000 valiant soldiers in that battle. It tells us that they carried away 200,000 captives. And so this is a very, very hard, difficult time for Isaiah's nation with especially a wicked man like Ahaz in charge. Now, eventually... The other thing that's going on behind the scenes is that Ahaz is going to make an alliance with the, the bully senior. He's going to contact Tilgath Blazer, the Assyrian, and he's going to start giving him his lunch money and say, you protect me from these two. Okay, does that make sense? I, it can be really confusing, especially with Syria and Assyria. But right now, bottom line, Judah is hanging on by a thread. They, they're, Syria and Israel have them surrounded you know, the whole north side of them uh, surrounded. And on top of that, in Second Kings, it tells us the Edomites had come, attacked Judah, and carried away captives. The Philistines had also invaded the cities of the lowland and the south of Judah and had taken Beth Shemesh and all these other cities and villages and, and, and the people that dwelt there. And so the wheels are coming off, literally surrounding Judah. They are surrounded by enemies and they've already experienced catastrophic losses. And they did not have the resources to ward off another attack by Israel. And so, verse 2, it says, It was told to the house of David, saying, Syria's forces are deployed in Ephraim. So his heart and the heart of his people, that is Ahaz, were moved as the trees of the woods are moved with the wind. Now we're from Ellensburg. We can picture that one pretty good. All right, Anything with wind, we're like, okay. Now I get it. Now, now I got what you're talking about. Uh, and just to clear something up here, it says Syria's forces are deployed in Ephraim. If you're not familiar, that's a s synonymous with the northern kingdom. Sometimes they are referred to as the house of Ephraim. That was one of the main tribes from the north. Uh, but uh, things, things are not good. And, and so um, Ahaz has at this point put all his chips in with Assyria, hoping that Assyria is going to defend them. And the Lord sends Isaiah 
and his son with a better offer. Like, you're, you're, you're going to Assyria. You think the senior guy is going to help you? He's just going to turn on you. I have a better offer for you. And so, and he also reveals to him that it was him that protected them the first time. But it says in verse 3, the Lord said to Isaiah, go now to meet Ahaz, you and Shear Jashub, that's his son, uh, your son it says, and, and his name again, if you remember, it means a remnant will return or only a remnant will return. He says, go and meet him with your son at the end of the aqueduct from the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field. Very specific spot. And say to him, take heed and be, not, be quiet. Do not fear or be faint-hearted for these two stubs of smoking firebrands for the fierce anger of reason in Syria and the son of Ramalia or Pekka because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Ramalia have plotted evil against you, saying, let us go against Judah and trouble it, and let us make a gap in its wall for ourselves and set a king over them, the son of Tabal. Now, I want you to just point out right away the, the obvious. Sometimes we miss the obvious. God knows exactly what is going on. He knows their exact plan. They're going to try to put, pull through the wall. They're going to place their own king in there. They're thinking this and, and thinking that, and... and and so he knows exactly what's going on. Ahaz and the people are, are freaked out because I, I, I've already painted the backstory for you. It's not good. Things are really, really difficult. And so now they have d these two powerful forces. This is what Ahaz, from his perspective, what he's seeing, it's just a matter of time. You know, I, I went already five rounds with these guys and I, I got my butt kicked and now here I've got to step back into the ring with him. It's not going to go well. And the Lord says, hold on, Ahaz. These guys are has-beens. These guys are spent. They're, they're burnt firebrands. There's nothing less. They're has-beens. They're, they're all smoke, no fire. They're, there's no power left there. Thus says the Lord, verse 7, it shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass. Even though Ahaz certainly doesn't deserve it, the Lord says, don't fear. Don't be faint-hearted. Ahaz hasn't done anything to honor the Lord with his life. But the Lord still says, don't fear. Uh, don't be faint-hearted. Be quiet. The enemy ha may have plans, but it ain't going to happen. You have my word on it. And uh, I, I just want to pause and give us a, a little bit of application here. Because this is the method that, what the, what, this is the motive of the, the enemy. This is what he wants to do in your life and mine, in, in a various amount of different ways. Uh, it's going to be different for you than it is for me, but he wants to incite fear in us. And the Lord's word to us is, don't be faint-hearted, don't fear, hey, just be quiet, just sit, wait, rest in me, and, and don't, you know, the enemy wants us to doubt God's provisions, says, I've, I've got you, but it doesn't matter what the enemy says, it matters what God says. And if you're not familiar with 2 Timothy 1, verse 7, I encourage you to, it's, a, it's an easy little verse to, to get it and, and memorize. It says that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. 2 Peter 1, verse 7. He has not given us a spirit of fear. If there's fear in my life, in any area, there's a disconnect somewhere. Because he had not given me that spirit. He has given me a spirit of power and of love and a sound mind. Ahaz isn't experiencing that. He doesn't have that spirit. <laughs> He's got a spirit of fear. Um, and so the Lord goes on and reassuring him. He says in verse 8, For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is reason. Within 65 years, Ephraim will be broken so that it will not be a people. Now, I don't know if you have like a, a footnote or something in your, in your Bible here about the 65 years. There's some question about that, some question the validity of the Bible because it didn't even take close to 65 years for the northern kingdom to, to be wiped out by the Assyrians. But, okay, then it's within 65 years, you know. But uh, there is a, a pretty interesting way that that 65 years becomes very, very accurate. From the date that he is having this conversation, the northern kingdom would be defeated in 14 years but it would be another 51 years until all the people were deported and they just, they weren't literally even a nation. They were a while, they were, they were people without a leader, but in 65 years, they were not a nation anymore. 
And so the Lord goes on, the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Romalia's son. Uh, these are the heads of the nations. The, uh, the, the implication is, but the Lord is, is head of them. You know, they may have control of their governments, they have control of the nations, but, but God's got all of this. And he says, they will not, he's saying, they will not be established in their own land. And he says, uh, that's not going to happen, but there's one condition here. Uh, the last part of verse 9. If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. Giving him all this reassuring, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. You, you know, it's going to be a remnant. It's you know, you're going to survive. But if you do not believe, you will not be established. And I'll just tell you, as you already know. Again, a lot of my job as a pastor is just to remind you of things you already know. When God says something comes to pass, it always comes to pass. That is how it's going to be. Uh, he says, but if you will not believe. Surely you will not be established. He would stop the invading armies that was going to happen, but not for Ahaz's sake. He must believe in the Lord's offer for protection, and that's the challenge to Ahaz, is to believe in the promises of God. And, and here, throughout the, the rest of our study tonight, that can be like a, an underlying application for each of our lives. Because that's the challenge, is to is to believe the promises of God. Yeah, we have a book. It's tiny but powerful in our little bookstore here. Um, it's called, uh, it's by Wilkerson, um, David Wilkerson, and it's called, it's called the, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's like 101 promises uh, from Scripture or something like that. But it's by David Wilkerson. I remember the author, and that's the most important part, right? Uh, and so he says, if you don't believe Ahaz, that's not going to affect the outcome, but it is going to affect you, right? As a believer, I'm going to spend eternity with the Lord. That's, that's going to happen. But trusting the Lord to that point is going to have effect on my life. And, and so he says, if you don't believe, it's not going to affect the outcome. It is going to affect you. And so the Lord says, you have to trust the plans that I'm going to make for you because the enemy's plans, they're not going to work out. They're, they're not going to be established. Your plans aren't going to work out. The only plans that are sure in this thing are my plans. And it seems like a no-brainer, but it probably doesn't feel that different that when we're going through something that's really hard and really difficult and someone says, you just have to trust God with this one, it's like, don't you kind of want to slap somebody a little bit when they say that, you know? But that's, that's what Isaiah is saying to Ahaz, you have to trust the Lord on this. And so he's in this emergency situation. He's got enemies on every side, but he thinks he already has a really, really good plan to get out of it. He's done some manipulation. He's done some, uh, you know, some under the table stuff with Assyria to trust in the Assyrians. But graciously, God says, I, I will protect you. That's going to happen. And I, and I will the potential is there for me to establish you and, and to show you that I mean my promise. Uh, I want you to give you a proof that you can trust in this promise. It says in verse 10, Moreover, the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord, your God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. Literally, it, it's like in heaven or hell. Ask it wherever. It, from top to bottom, ask anything. And so... Just to kind of step back from it a little bit, Isaiah's given him this pep talk. You need to have faith. God's going to take care of all of it. And God says, hey, let me prove it to you. Ask anything. What do you want? You know, Noah got a rainbow. Do you want a rainbow? I'll give you a rainbow, you know. Do you want a, do you want a flying mole? I can do that. Whatever you want, you know, from the earth beneath to the heavens above, I, I can, you know, add a horn onto a sparrow. Whatever you want, I can, I can do it. Just tell me. This is a freebie. You name the price. You name the sign. But Ahaz said, verse 12, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Oh, that sounds so respectful. It sounds so spiritual. He even is quoting scripture. Deuteronomy 16, 6, 16 says, You shall not tempt the Lord your God or, or test the Lord your God. But it's not tempting or testing God if it's doing what he's told you to do. If he's commanding you to do something, he said, no, I wouldn't do that. Well, that now you're testing God. 
He, he's doing it right now. And so if he asks us to trust him and we refuse, that's on us. And so it's as simple as Ahaz has no intention of trusting God and every intention of using his own resources and manipulation and his power and, and, he, and his own devised plan that he has. And he doesn't trust God's unseen plan. Nope, I have this all worked out in my head. Now, I need to point this out, not to get too technical here in the midst of this application, but uh, up to this point, everything has been spoken directly to Ahaz. But in verse 13, and this is important, Isaiah begins to address not only Ahaz, but it says the house of David. So he says, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord, verse 13. Then he said, Isaiah said, Hear now, O house of David. It is a small thing for you to weary men, but will you weary my God also? It's one thing to try my patience or to try another human's patience, but when you're wearying God's patience, that's an issue. That's a problem. You know, is, is God that untrustworthy to you that, that you won't even ask for a sign? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. You didn't ask for one, but you're getting one. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Curds and honey he shall eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. Now, we know this refers to the birth of Christ. Matthew quotes this in chapter 1 of his book, verse 23. Uh, but I want to point out that Isaiah here, and this is really fascinating to me, okay? Maybe I've lost you with some of the history, but this is, this is pretty interesting. Isaiah uses a, a definitive article here, which, mean, which means he says, it's not a virgin will conceive, but it's the virgin. It's a specific virgin. The virgin is going to conceive. And the only other place in the Old Testament where it mentions a virgin birth, does anybody know where, where, where I'm taking this? But the only other place in the Old Testament where it references a virgin birth is found in Genesis 3, verse 15, called the Proto-Evangelicum. It means the, the first reference of the gospel. The Lord said, I will put enmity between you, the serpent, and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Between your seed and her seed, genetically women don't have the seed. And this speaks of the virgin birth. And, and so all the way back in Eden, as soon as mankind fell... God had promised a solution to the problem of sin that would come from the seed of a woman, that it would come through a virgin bearing a son. And I think this is what Isaiah is getting at when he says the virgin, man, this, this promised one, this Messiah is coming. He is Emmanuel, God with us. God is going to become flesh and dwell among us. And I, I love the word and the concept of Emmanuel, and we could spend a whole session just talking about that, but um, tonight we're going to talk about a, a few things that we're familiar with, but we're almost overly familiar with them. Emmanuel is, is God with us. It, it's God in human flesh. C.S. Lewis, I, I love this quote, said, the Son of God became a man so that the Son of men could become sons of God. That's why he came. And, and we're assured of the, of the presence of God. It's God with us. Because the Lord didn't say, lo, I will be with you most of the time. It's lo, I will be with you always. The, the promise is Emmanuel. It's God with us. And so whatever you're experiencing, it's God with us. Trouble in the marriage, God with us. Trouble with the kids, God with us. Trouble with the older kids, the adult kids. God is, is with us. If the outlook from the doctor is, is not good, God is with us. Emmanuel. It's, just, it's really powerful. It's, it's incredible. Whatever you're facing, that's the promise that we have. Now, just like Ahaz, we have a challenge to believe that. Is God, is God, God, are you with me in this? Are you there? And so, getting back to our text, the Lord offered Ahaz a sign for deliverance for his day and time right then. But when Isaiah refused to ask, God promised a, a sign for the entire nation, the house of Judah. But he does give Ahaz, I believe, a sign 
uh, for his own time in verse 16. It says, For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that you dread will be forsaken by both her kings. Now, I need you to pay attention here and follow along what I'm about to say because, again, this is a little tricky because there's some subtle changes that we don't pick up on. The, the you is plural in verses 13 and 14, like y'all, right? Jim, you're from Texas, y'all. But in verse 16, it goes back to you singular. Now, now he's speaking directly to Ahaz again. And I wouldn't be extremely dogmatic on this, but it very well may be in what I believe is taking place here is that he's now pointing, when it says the child, I know it's capitalized in your Bible here in verse 16, but I don't think this is a reference to Emmanuel. I think he's pointing to his own son. I think before it's it's plural, the nation, this is going to happen, the virgin will have a, you know, a, a, man, a barren conceive, conceive and bear a child, a son, and it calls name Emmanuel. But now I think he's talking directly to Ahaz again. Before the child, because remember, he brought his own son with him. It says, before the child shall know to refuse the evil and the good, the land that you dread will be forsaken by both her kings. And so it says, before my son knows the difference between right and wrong, God is going to dispatch these two kings. That is going to happen. That's the sign for you. It's going to happen. And... Um, the Lord is going to do that. Now, I need to add, again, I said this, this section of Isaiah is filled with a lot of current events that we need to familiarize ourselves with the background on. But he is going to take care of um, Pekka and Reason and, and these two kings. They are going to be taken care of by Assyria, but not before everything is just, it's not just peachy keen with Judah. They are going to be in their own hot water, uh, so to speak, with Assyria themselves. And so Second Chronicles 28, let me just read this to you. It tells us that Tilgath-Pileser, the king of Assyria, came to him, Ahaz, and distressed him and did not assist him. For Ahaz took part of the treasuries from the house of the Lord, from the house of the king, and from the leaders and gave it to the king of Assyria. But he did not help him. His plan was backfiring. It goes on and says, Now in the time of his distress, King Ahaz became increasingly unfaithful to the Lord. This is that King Ahaz. And I love that in St. Chronicles where it, it tells this bleak story. It says, this is that King Ahaz. You know, wink, wink, it's that guy. It's, it's that bad. And so if he just would have been as desperate, and again, we can make some application to our own lives. If he just would have been as desperate for the counsel from the Lord, for advice from the Lord, for wisdom in the Lord, as he was from Assyria, the world power, the strong and mighty, the obvious answer to his thing, it would have gone so much better for him. Now, Isaiah is going to describe this invasion by Assyria in the rest of the chapter. It says in verse 17, The Lord will bring the king of Assyria upon you and your people and your father's house, days that have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah. Not since, you know, they were one unified nation. Is it going to be this bad? And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will whistle for the fly that is the farthest parts of the rivers of Egypt and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria. Um, and so what's going to happen is that Assyria is going to defeat Reason and Pekka. They're going to defeat Syria and Israel, and then they're going to move south to face Egypt, the, the other world power at the time. Egypt, in preparation for that, knowing they're coming, is going out to meet them. Well, where are they meeting? They're meeting right in Judah. They're in the crosshairs between these two world powers. And so it says in verse 19, They will come, and all of them will rest in the desolate valleys and in the clefts of the rocks and on all thorns and in all pastures. In the same day, the Lord will shave <clears throat> uh, with a hired razor, with those from beyond the river, with the king of Assyria, the head and the hair of the legs, and will also remove the beard. The Lord's like, I'm going to use them to shave you completely. And that is a 
you know, that is an, an offense to an Easterner. That's a big deal. And it's an offense to Michael, you know. Um, to shave the beard, you know, that is an, an attack. And it really was. We have a hard time thinking about this. Okay, a guy has a beard. He doesn't have a beard. But to take his facial hair, to shave his legs, unless you're swimming with a Speedo on, you know, you don't shave the legs, you know. But that's what they're going to do. And, and check this, verse 21, which will be in that day. This is, this is a judgment, right? Keep this in mind. In that day, that a man will keep alive a young cow and two sheep. They're forced into vegetarianism. That is exactly what it's pointing out. They're forced vegetarianism. They can't butcher the animal. They can't have the, the lamb chops or the burgers. He can't do that, man. So he's got to keep alive a young cow. He's got to try to get some milk from it. He's going to need, you know, whatever you get from sheep. Well, I don't know, but he's got to keep them alive and he can't kill them. Verse 22, so it shall be from the abundance of the milk they give that he will eat curds for curds and honey everyone will eat who is left in the land. It shall happen in that day that whatever there could be, that wherever there could be a thousand vines worth a thousand shekels of silver, it will be for briars and thorns. They're going to be cut off from the land that they used to farm. It's just going to be close quarters, a little animal here, just daily trying, trying to get out some, some milk from it and, and make a little butter from it, and that's, that's how you're surviving Verse 24, with arrows and bows, men will come there because all the land will become briars and thorns. And to any hill which could be dug with a hoe, you will not go there for fear of briars and thorns, but it will become a range for oxen and a place for sheep or mountain goats to roam. Now, before we head to chapter 8, there's something that I, it's really cool to me. And so therefore, as I say before, it's got to be cool to you too. And so... I want you to flip over to Isaiah 36, okay? We're going to come right back to Isaiah chapter 8, but, but flip over to Isaiah 36. Now, I have this premise that I believe is scriptural, that there's nothing in the Bible by accident, that there's no detail that is not there without a purpose. Sometimes we don't always understand that purpose, but it is always there. And oftentimes, with a little bit of digging, we see some really fascinating things. Now, in Isaiah 36, Ahaz's son Hezekiah is king. And it's roughly 30 years later, and it's not tilgath pileser that's in charge of the Assyrians anymore. It's Sennacherib, and they're making a ferocious attempt again to demolish Judah. And like his father, Hezekiah is left with a choice to trust God. Look at chapter 36. It came to pass in the 14th year of King Hezekiah that Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. Then the king of Assyria sent Rabshakeh with a great army from Lachish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem. And he stood by the aqueduct from the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field. I want you to notice the location. In, a, in chapter 7... Verse 1, it said, It came to pass in the days of Ahaz that Rezin, king of Syria, and Pekah went up to Jerusalem to make war, and they could not prevail. And it's, um, oh, it's verse 3. Yes, it says in 7 3, The Lord said to Isaiah, Go now and meet Ahaz, you and Shear Jashub, your son, at the end of the aqueduct from the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field. Hezekiah. It is meeting General Rabshakeh, who's trying to overthrow Judah, and he's at the same spot where his father exactly decided that he could trust the Assyrians more than, than the Lord. And now Hezekiah is in that exact same physical position, and he's pressed with the very same decision to make, and he does a better job than Gad did. Okay, I just think that's cool that they're standing in the same spot. Now, back to eight. You guys doing Okay. One of you is doing all right, okay. The rest, the rest of you, you're getting your legs shaved. <laughs> Moreover, the Lord said to me, take a large scroll and write on it in a man, with a man's pen. In the Hebrew, that word is sharpie, actually. Um, concerning Meher Shalal Hashbaz. Longest name in the Bible, love it. It means pillage hastens or, 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 or looting hastens and... Um, and, and, and 
pirating speeds, and it's that same idea that it comes quickly and goes fast. Now, uh, he's told us before that much, in chapter one, he told us that much of what he has here is this is a vision from the Lord, but here it's different. He's commanded to write something for public reading. He get a large scroll, get a whiteboard and a sharpie. Well, it's not, I'm not going to wipe it off. This is going to be to last, and let's teach the people about your son's unusual name. You know, I'm going to write that. You're going to name your son that. Uh, so it says in verse 2, And I will take for myself faithful witnesses to record Uriah the priest and Zechariah the son of um, Jeber, Jeberchiah. And so they got these two men to validate the message. Verse 3, Then I went to the prophetess, and she conceived and bore a son, his wife. And the Lord said to me, Call his name Ahir Shalal Hashbaz. For before the child shall have knowledge to cry, my father and my mother, the riches of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria will be taken away before or by the king of Assyria. So by way of this large scroll in the name of your son, I want you to warn the people of Assyria's power. They hastened to pillage. They were quick to loot. And before your son can say Abba, they are going to destroy and get rid of resin and Syria and that whole problem, Damascus, all of that. But he's warning them, do not trust Assyria. They might have a solution to your short-term problem, but you cannot trust them. And um, so verse 5 The Lord also spoke to me again, saying, Inasmuch as these people refused the waters of Shiloh, or like you can think of like the pool of Siloam, it's talking about the same thing. The waters of Shiloh that flow softly and rejoice in resin and Ramalia's son. Now therefore, behold, the Lord brings up over them the waters of the river, strong and mighty, the king of Assyria in all its glory. And so... Um, we're told here, Isaiah loves using these, these word pictures to describe what's going on, and you're refusing this pool, and you're accepting the river, right, is, is, is what he's saying, this nice, soft, gentle stream, and you're accepting the river. And we're told that the river is Assyria. And he says he will go over this river of Assyria, over all its channels, and go over all its banks. Assyria is going to flood the area. It's going to go beyond the boundaries that it is intended to have and that they're in right now. And he will, verse 8, pass through Judah. He will overflow and pass over. He will reach up to the neck, and the stretching out of his wings will fill the breadth of your land, O Emmanuel. And so... Isaiah declared that those who would seek aid from Assyria right now in this moment, rather than trust God, it's the equivalent of refusing to drink from a drinking fountain. Push the button, trickle, 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 nice cold water. And instead they're refusing that and they're like, I'll take a fire hydrant and open that and put it in my mouth. No, you're refusing the good thing, and and, and you think this is going to help, but it's going to flood you. It's going to drown you. It's going to be too much. And and so you don't want this this stream, Shiloh, Siloam. It's got got its root word is peace, and you want a flood that's going to nearly wipe you out. It's going to go up to your necks, not over your heads, because remember, there's going to be a remnant. There's going to be a a part of you that that can endure this, but it's going to take you right up to your necks. And, uh, and I'll just point out, too, that the land that they're invading, Judah, he says it's not really your land, Ahaz, it's the Lord's land. It's your land, O Emmanuel. And so it's a call for the nation to, to humbly repent, trust the Lord, instead of trusting in the strength and the ingenuity of man. And he says it's going to backfire. Be shattered, verse 9, O you peoples, and be broken in pieces. Give ear, all you from far countries. Gird yourselves, but be broken in pieces. Gird yourselves, but be broken in pieces. It says, gather up, get suited up for war, and you're going to lose. You can prepare, but you're not going to be protected. Uh, take counsel together, but it will come to nothing. You can come up with a battle plan or a peace treaty, but unless the Lord is in it, you're spinning your wheels. It's not going to come to fruition. Speak the word, but it will not stand. For God is with us. He's with those who, who trust in his word. And again, there's some application there for us. It, the Lord is with us. He's with those who are trusting in his word, trusting in his promises. These others, Ahaz included, aren't trusting in the promises of God. Therefore, the Lord is not with them. The Lord is with those who trust his promises. 
Um, verse 11. For the Lord spoke thus to me with a strong hand and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people, saying, Do not say a conspiracy concerning all that this people call a conspiracy, nor be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. Uh, now, there's a question here about, well, like, what's the conspiracy? That's always the question, right? And people are still asking that today. What's the conspiracy? Everything is a conspiracy. But uh, it could be that he's talking this conspiracy is this confederation between Syria and, and Israel. And, and the Lord says, I don't want you to think of it that way. You know, this is, I'm, I'm behind all this. Uh, but there's also those, and, and I, this could very well maybe it, who are accusing Isaiah of being unpatriotic. You're speaking out against the king's plans. You're speaking out against joining forces with Assyria, this, this most powerful nation, and, and you must be in a conspiracy. You must be trying to cause a downfall. And that's probably more likely what's being uh, referred to here. But the Lord says, man, don't even pay attention to all that. Instead, this is what you need to pay attention to. Verse 13, the Lord of hosts, him you shall hallow, or set aside as, as holy, completely set apart. Let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. Be more concerned, and again, guys, this is a word for every single one of us. Be more concerned about your relationship with the Lord than the relationship with those around you. That's what it means to fear the Lord, is I value him above all not above popularity, not above getting rich, not above anything. I don't fear any of those things as much as I fear the Lord. Remember, Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, verses 4 and 5, said, I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body. And after that, have no more that they can do. I mean, that's it. That's all they can do to you. All they can do to you is kill you. But I will show you to whom you should fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has the power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. And so Isaiah is, is given this reminder in the middle of, because this is a difficult time for Isaiah too, right? He lives in this time. He, he isn't just sitting back in a, in a prophet's house somewhere writing these long-distance emails off to Ahaz. Hey, you guys are in trouble. This is his nation. He's in, the, he's in the middle of it. And so he's reminded to stay focused on the Lord. And then he is given a promise. He will be as a sanctuary. And you fear the Lord, then he's going to be a sanctuary. But a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both houses of Israel, both the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, as a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble. They shall fall and be broken, be snared and taken. For those who trust in the Lord, who, who fear him, he is this refuge, this sanctuary, this rock of protection. But those who don't trust him, he says, they're going to stumble, they're going to fall, they're going to be broken. And, uh, you know, this, this passage is quoted a couple times in the New Testament. It's quoted in 1 Peter chapter 2. It's quoted in Romans chapter 9. And, in, and it says that Jesus is the rock for the believer. He's the, the, the rock of offense. He's the one that, you know, we can build our, the chief cornerstone that we can build our life on. And if you're not building your life on him, the one area that you're going to fail in life, you might succeed with everything else, but the one area that you're going to fail and be broken is this area. It's with Jesus and so th this truth that, that, we're rem that Isaiah is reminded of, I need to be reminded of it. We need to be reminded of it. Trust in the Lord. He's a rock. He's a refuge. Psalm 46, God is a refuge and our strength, our very present help in time of trouble. I need to remember that. There's times in my life, in my week, where I have got to remember that because I see this situation. I see these finances. I see this thing. Oh, no, the Lord is a rock, he's a shelter, he's a sanctuary, he's a refuge, he's, he's all of that run into him. Verse 16, bind up the testimony, probably referring to the scroll, the scroll, the scroll that he had written on before, and seal the law among my disciples, and I will wait on the Lord. Now, I've got to point this out real quick too, because... Sometimes we read in Scripture, um, 
those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength, you know, and just, we just got to rest. We just got to sit back and, and let the Lord do. But that's, the word wait, is not, it's not that idea, okay? It's more like a waiter. I'm, I'm here. I'm ready to serve. I'm ready to be active. I'm ready to do. And um, so when you read the word wait in the Old Testament, like in that setting, that's the, I, the idea. And so he says, man, I'm going to seal the law among my disciples, and I will wait upon the Lord. Man, I'm going to be at his bidding, whatever he calls me to do, who hides his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope in him. Here am I and the children whom the Lord has given me. We are for signs and wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells in Mount Zion. Isaiah says, look at me. Look at the message that I'm presenting to you. Look at my kids. This is the word of the Lord for you. It's a testimony that God has for you. And this is so fascinating. I encourage you to jot down here, if your Bible doesn't say this, to put down Hebrews chapter 2. I think it's verses 14 and 15 right in there. But in Hebrews, this is the attitude the Lord says he has about us. We're a testimony to the world of who the Lord is. Look, look at, you know, here I am and the children the Lord has given me. We are a walking, living testimony of that. When we go out to the world about what the Lord has done in our lives. Um, verse 19, now this is pretty fascinating, and this is unfortunately making a comeback in today's world. It was popular in the 50s and it kind of slowly died out, but it is gaining strength. Uh, when you say, seek those who are mediums and wizards who whisper and mutter, should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it's because there is no light in them. They, the people are resorting to every means possible. They're going to Assyria. They're going to whatever. Uh, we're looking for direction for our lives. We're in a tough spot, but they, they, they won't look to the Lord. And the contrast that he says here, it couldn't be greater. Why are you who are alive? Why would you prefer to communicate with the dead rather than with the Lord? I mean, can you hear yourselves right now? You're already doing better than they ever were, right? You're, you're, you're living. God, but here's this point. God sent living prophets like Isaiah. He has the law, the testimony it mentions here. He has the living word of God that he wants to speak into your life. Why are you going out there? And again, I said this thing is... is it's growing in momentum, the spiritism, uh, occultish type of palm reading. I'm just always amazed when I'm driving around like, you know, Aurora in Seattle or something, and you see a palm. I'm like, how? How do these people stay in existence? It's just, is there anybody else think that's just crazy? Okay, thank you, okay? It's just nuts. But it's gaining in momentum that, you know, the, the, the crystal ball, all that just stuff that we'd say, well, that's just crazy, you know? It, and stay away from it. Don't even mess with it. Don't even play with it because it is demonic and it's going in the wrong direction. That's his point. He says, you're going, in the, you're going to the dead instead of the living. You're headed in the wrong direction. And, and that's what he is going to continue to point out here in verse 21. They will pass through it hard-pressed and hungry and it, shall and it shall happen when they are hungry that they will be enraged and curse their king and their God and look upward then they will look down, look to the earth and see troubles and darkness and gloom of anguish and they'll be driven into darkness. They turn to everything but the Lord for direction in their lives. They, look, they turn to the dark things like mediums and, and spiritists, but they had no light in them and, and, and looking to them, looking for them to direction is only going to lead them farther into darkness, right? Okay, they're looking to darkness. It's only going to, they're only going to reach their destination of more darkness, it's like Jesus when he said, how can the blind lead the blind? How can you expect to go there and, and, and get to a direction that's it's this way? You're headed the wrong direction. He says, you're never going to find your way in life by looking to the blind, looking for someone that's in the dark. They have no answers. It's just more trouble, more darkness, more gloom, more anguish, he says here. Now, we are going to get just into chapter 9 because I don't want to leave us um, in darkness and gloom and anguish and all that. So uh, chapter 9 gives us some hope. And uh, this darkness is met by light, and the focus returns to the promised Messiah. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed, as when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward more heavily oppressed her. 
by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, in Galilee of the Gentiles. So he tells us here that this land of Zebulun, Naphtali, the Galilee, this is the northern portion of Israel, this area of Galilee and Nazareth. And that was always the first place that invasions would come. Anytime there's an invasion to Israel, that is where it began. It's in, in the northern spot. They were weaker there. And it's during the Assyrian invasion that's kind of taking place concurrent with this that things got really bad. And in fact, it, it's subtle, but it doesn't say Galilee of Israel. It says Galilee of the Gentiles. That shouldn't be. Galilee is in Israel. It should say that, but, but, but they're just always in this place of darkness and gloom. It's just, it's rough up there. It's, it's like the Wild West out there, you know, and they get, they get taken over. But that same area that's experienced throughout their history, pain and darkness, is going to be uniquely blessed. Verse 2, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelled in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. Now, if we were just reading right, right through this and reading through Isaiah and just like, okay, I'm reading my Bible, that's all I'm doing, you know, and without, you know, kind of looking at it, and we wouldn't catch it. And, and I don't think that people in Isaiah's own day understood the full impact of what he's saying here. But Jesus is the light that would come to that area. And this is where he spent most of his life ministry was in this area. Listen to this from Matthew 4, 13. It says, leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea, which is what we just read, by the sea, in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. Then he quotes what we just read here in Isaiah. So this, he's saying this present darkness and gloom and anguish that they're experiencing, man, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. And it's not going to compare to the future. That darkness is not going to compare to the future light that they will receive. And that's what Jesus does for all of us, right? And in a sense, all of us at one point were a Zebulun, a Naphtali, by the sea, Galilee of, you know, the Gentiles. We, we were in a place of darkness, a darkness of our soul until Jesus came in and brought light. That's what he does everywhere he goes. So it happened in the north there. It happens in our lives. Hopefully it happens in an ever-increasing pattern in our lives. John said that he was the true light that gives light to every man coming into the world. So we are either spending our time walking in that light, in his light, or we are walking and living in the darkness. Now, the other possibility that we think is a possibility is that we can say we're in the light but actually be in the darkness. John confronted this in 1 John chapter 1. He said, if we say that we have fellowship with him, uh, but we walk in darkness, we lie. And we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now the problem, as I said, we were all originated in this place of flesh, darkness, you know, born into a broken humanity. And so the problem comes for many of our friends, our family, maybe for us, I mean, we resisted the Lord for a long time. Jesus addressed that very issue when he was talking to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. He said, this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, but men love darkness more than the light. That's the problem. But that doesn't, that doesn't stop our mission of spreading the light. Of, of letting that light shine in our own hearts. Well, Isaiah continues, verse five or three, you have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of the harvest. And I think there's something there for study too. You know, the fields are ripe for the harvest. As men rejoice when they divide the spoil. I'm just talking about this ministry of Jesus that's going to bring this area incredible joy. Verse 4, for you have broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. Now, the most, the victory that Israel had over Midian was by who? Does anybody remember who defeated the Midianites? Pretty famous Bible story. Gideon. Gideon defeated the Midianites, and he did it 
if you remember, by sounding a trumpet and shining a light. Uh, I think there's something there. And it's the same way that Jesus finds victory. Uh, we got to move on. Verse 5, for every warrior's sandal from the noisy battle. This is not one that you're going to find in a Hallmark card. Every warrior's sandal from the noisy battle and garments rolled in blood will be used for burning and fuel of fire. There you go. <laughs> he's saying the victory is going to be sure, is what he's saying. Because, and this is what you did when the victory was over. When you were victorious and you won, you took all the, the, the bloody garments and all of that, you heaped it up, deal with it, right? The Jews were clean, clean, clean people, and they, they sterilized, and you burned it up and used it for fuel. So the victory is certain, and the source of that victory, verse 6, is Emmanuel. For unto us a child is born. You know, you, this verse is on so many Christmas cards, but they never include verse 5. You've got to keep context, context, context. <laughs> I would, I'll pay someone if they put that on a Christmas card this year. For unto, a <laughs> for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This is, we're going to keep moving here. I'm not going to spend, we could spend weeks on this verse, right? Even if you're not familiar with the, with the Bible, you've, you've heard this verse. But in one verse, Isaiah looks to both the first and the second coming of Jesus. In one verse, he speaks of both the humanity of Jesus unto us, a child is born. And he speaks of the divinity of Jesus. And unto us, a son is given. It's the son, it's Emmanuel, it's God with us. And he had to be fully God and fully man. If he were not fully man, he could never take our place at, at Calvary. He could never be a representative of us if he wasn't man. He had to be mankind. And if he were not fully God, his sacrifice on Calvary would never be enough. There's no man that, that could ever pay the price of sin. And this is why it is so important. And I, I love we love our Mormon friends and Jehovah's Witness friends and, and all these others who, who take away from the deity of Jesus, but it is paramount to understand that Jesus is God, fully God and fully man. And to not be fully one or the other is to diminish what he did at Calvary and to make it for naught, and we're still lost in sin. It is of utmost importance. And so um, <clears throat> it says his name will be called, and, and not like these are Jesus' names, but these are characteristics. Wonderful. Isn't he wonderful? I love that song. He amazes. We're going to spend eternity learning of him, considering him. And I'll tell you what, any other subject in the universe, that would make you bored. But not him, because he's wonderful. He amazes. The, we're, 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 we're always going to be left wanting more forever because he's wonderful. And the more that we know him, the more that we're going to want to know him. He's wonderful. He is counselor. He's the, he's the endless source of wisdom. You know, And if only Ahaz would have believed that in these chapters right here, right? But Ahaz would not believe that. But he... Let's not just sit back and point our finger at Ahaz. Let's remember this for our own life. He has wisdom for our lives. He is the counselor. If you need counseling, we live in a world that is just saturated with counseling. Go to the counselor. Go to the one who made your psyche. And walk-ins are welcome. You know, anybody can, anytime can meet with the counselor. And it won't charge you an arm and a leg. He's, our, he's paid the price for you to go see the counselor. That's the best part. He is mighty God. And again, I, this is one of those, I know we got this doctrine, I just discussed it. Uh, he is God in, in almighty flesh. But just spend an evening, a morning in your devotions, trying to just wrap your mind around that. But the one who, who 
who made you became flesh. It's incredible. He's mighty God. Everlasting Father. The idea is that he is the originator of it all. He's not saying that Jesus is the Father. You know, we, there's, there's a distinction between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's a unity, you know what I'm saying? But he's not saying he is the Father, but he's the originator of everything. One of my favorite portions of Scripture is Colossians 1, 15 and 16. It says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn or the preeminent over all creation. For by him all things that were, were made that were made, and, and, and all things, whether visible and in, invisible, and they were made for him, or by him and for him. Love that. He's, he's made them, and they were made for him. Also, it says he's the prince of peace, the we know the word for peace. We just talked about it this last Sunday morning. Shalom, shalom. Shalom is more, peace is more in Scripture than the absence of war, right? That's kind of the only way we really use peace is that there's no conflict. But shalom in, in, in the Hebrew is, is more than that. It means completeness. It means health. Just it, it, everything is running as it should, you know, in, in your life. It's, it's completeness, wholeness, rightness. And he's the only way to find and to keep and to have true peace. He is the only way. And I'll, let me have you turn one more place. We're actually going to stop um, in, in after verse 7, but let me just have you turn to Romans really quick because this is such a powerful, powerful verse talking about Jesus being the prince of peace because ultimately he's the one that, that gives us peace with God and that's what Romans 5 verse 1 says. Obviously, there's some context here. If you're not familiar, when it starts with the word therefore, you should always look what it's there for. But my point is, is a little bit later on in the verse. It says, having been justified. We, this, these are some concepts that we've been talking about a lot lately on Sunday mornings as well. But to be justified is to be declared legally righteous. Okay, So, having been declared legally righteous by faith, that's how it is. It's not by doing the job. It's not by working hard. It's not by attendance. It's not by tithe. It's not by anything. We are declared legally righteous by faith. We have peace. Shalom. You know, obviously, it was written in the Greek, but the same concept. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only source, the true source of peace. And Again, if you're not familiar with some of these ideas and, and, and principles, unless you are in relationship with Jesus in faith, declared legally righteous, you are an enemy of God. The Bible clearly teaches that. You, uh, you have said and, and raised your fist, so to speak, in the face of God, I am against you. But through Jesus, through the blood of the sacrifice at Calvary, he made a way where there was no way. He, he took down that wall of separation, as Ephesians says, and now we have peace with God. Ah, that's Jesus. And, and if, if nothing else has blown you away tonight about who he is, I hope that does. Because this almighty God of the universe that we're, you know, we spent a, a moment trying to consider, we were his enemy. And Jesus took it away so we could have peace with him. Verse 7. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with justice, with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. Now, we're going to stop there because we enter a new section that continues really all the way into verse like 4 of chapter 10. And so we're going to stop right there. But uh, it says he's going to be on the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with ju judgment and justice. The millennium period is going to last for a thousand years, but Jesus is never going to stop ruling. It's going to be forever and ever and ever. Uh, Handel was right, you know. He shall reign. That's going to that's gonna be the case. But the important thing for us is to, is to have him rule today 
in our lives, in our hearts, is to let the peace of God rule in our hearts. And Jesus is our peace. Let's pray.